Welcome back to the Dale Wiley Show. Today, I'm lucky to be with Scott Kipner, a rock and roll legend with the Dictators and the Dell Lords in his own solo career. Scott, I, I'm glad to have a time to get to talk to you a little bit. Um, how's everything going in, in Los Angeles? Pretty good. I'm actually, uh, the wife and I moved a few months ago. We're up in Santa Barbara now. So oh, I'm wow. Okay. I'm about 90 miles north of, uh, yeah. of L.A. right now. Yeah. Um, yeah it's, going, it's going well. You know, I mean, I'm a New Yorker at heart. I'll always be a New Yorker. <laughs> I mean, I'm born, I follow New York politics way more than I follow California politics. And but, you follow uh, those I, it, Yankees. It works out real well living here. <laughs> and you follow those Yankees as well. You're not switching oh, to the West Coast. Oh, yeah. I still watch at least 100 games a year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's awesome. Um, well, so Scott, you know, of course, uh, what what brought you to Santa Monica what, or Santa Barbara? What made you go north? We are we are in um, Montecito. It's kind of a nice little area here in, inside Santa Barbara. Uh-huh. And my wife and I have been working for. Um, she worked for a company that was centered uh, here in that. 10 miles south of Santa Barbara, a town called Carpinteria. Uh-huh. And uh, it kind of brought her, the company ended up being sold. And she's still, she's the personal assistant to the two uh, co founders and owners of the company. And they live up here. So they put us, uh, we're now living in a house up to we're like five minutes. Rather, it used to take Sharon about a half hour or so to get to work. Now it takes her. About 20 seconds to walk across the <laughs> courtyard, past our swimming pool, into our <laughs> guest house where her office is. Oh, wow. So I'm that's... living a good life, you know. I'm living a good life. I'm very happy yeah. up here. Our dog, Sally, is extremely <laughs> happy up here. She's made the discovery of squirrels and lizards, <laughs> which uh, she roams the property every morning looking for, you know, making sure that we're safe from those squirrels and lizards. And, oh, wow. of course, you know, she never catches anything by the time she <laughs> catches up to a lizard, that lizard's, like, I think, in Argentina at that point. Yeah, but, uh, absolutely. She doesn't know what to do with them anyway. She doesn't have the, any kind of real aggression or ferociousness. I think she just wonders what the hell they are, basically. <laughs> well, that sounds like a fun life. That, that sounds it's great. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. It is. Uh, so, uh, Scott, kind of, uh, yeah. you, I saw something on um, one of your posts recently that I – just got a big kick out of. I guess maybe it was kind of a, a rock and roll introduction to you in a way, but um, tell me about being in high school with Ace Freely. I got a That was college. Out. Oh, that was college. Okay. That was college. That was actually that. the uh, one term that I went to college. And um, <laughs> after having they had a pretty successful academic career, uh, rock and roll was getting more and more real in my life as far as me as a participant and that one term that I went to college the only thing I'd ever failed in my life I failed music so I figured well, I know what to do for a living I'll be a musician there you go <laughs> but Ace, Ace the college was in the Bronx and Ace was from the Bronx his name is Paul but everyone called him Ace even back then and he would show up like before classes, everyone would sort of congregate in the cafeteria and just hang out there until the bell rang for their class. And he would show up every morning with two quarts of Colt 45, which I don't know if you've ever tasted that stuff, but it seems like the kind of stuff you would threaten somebody with as opposed to give it to them as a, you know, <laughs> a drink. And um, he was the first guy who ever taught me how to play, like, read some couple of Led Zeppelin songs. He told, told me how to play Black Dog. And um, then this was back in the days when uh, Quaaludes first hit New York, you know. Uh-huh. And I was never much of a, a pill kind of guy or anything, but, I, you know, I did have the temptation to try it. So I tried it one day while I was sitting in the cafeteria there in the morning, and an hour later, Ace was carrying me to the bathroom. <laughs> but he was a real nice guy, giggled, called everybody curly. And I lost track of him after that until the dictators were already up and going. And my manager had taken me to Philadelphia, to the Philadelphia Spectrum, to go see The Who. And Leonard Skinner with the opening act. And 
I've never been much of a fan of uh, the Southern rock thing, of, of that style, like Allman, Marshall Tucker, Leonard Skinner, all that stuff. And so I got up from my seat because I was so anxious to see the who I couldn't sit still. And I was walking around the corridors of the Philadelphia Spectrum and I ran into Ace. Oh, wow. So they telling me, oh, man, yeah, I, I got this band. You got to come see my band. We're playing out at this club in, in Queens called the Coventry, which was a place that we had played uh-huh. several times. And it was one of the few places in all of New York where you really didn't have to be a cover band to play. Uh-huh. And I went to see, I, I mean, I don't know how many shows they could have possibly done before that night. But it was very, very early on. They Kiss did not have a record deal. And the whole show, the production values of the show were kind of like the Little Rascals. You know, hey, my mom could make the costume. Hey, we could sell lemonade over here. I mean, <laughs> everything was entirely homemade. Everything that became sort of state of the art was really at the construction paper and, and Elmer's glue level at that point. Oh, wow. Makeup was crude. The songs were crude. I guess the songs remained crude. But everything <laughs> about it was, it, was it, it, never, it didn't seem like there was any potential whatsoever to me really? at all. But about six months later, we started hearing reports of how Kiss, they had had a couple of records out at this point. They, were, they put out those first three records back to back to back. Right. And we were on the same booking agency. Okay. And we started getting these reports that KISS were blowing all the bands they were opening for, that they were blowing all these bands off the stage. And I was just incredulous at the thing that I saw doing that. So right. I had to go see for myself. So at one point they were playing the Beacon Theater on up the Broadway. And um being on the same agency I was able to get tickets. And the whole thing where it had looked like a Little Rascals or high school production was completely in place. Every single tiniest detail had grown to the point where, holy cow, these guys could take over the world. This was really? my impression that night. <laughs> and that was it. I really didn't see him. I saw, I saw Ace a couple more times. He was a bad drinker. You know, I think that's kind uh-huh. of a well-known thing about him. And, I yeah. remember one night him showing up at CBGB's. It was him and some guy in a suit, right? And you didn't see many people in suits at CBGB's, but there was Ace, and the guy in the suit turned out to be his accountant. And the first thing he does, he comes over and he says, hi, and he gives me and all my friends each $20 so that we <laughs> can drink. And his, his accountant writes it down, $120 <laughs> for Ace's friends to drink. And... um he was driving a DeLorean. Remember those things? Yeah. Yeah, the kind where the cars opened up like like wings, sort of. Like they opened oh, yeah. up from the bottom yeah. up. And that was also a car that it wasn't very long after he managed to total. Oh, wow. And uh, that was the last I ever really saw him, you know? I never really saw him again. I saw him once that he didn't see me. And it was so many years later, I had no idea if he recognized me. And rather then just run up to him in the street and try to remind him. I just kind of let it go. Uh-huh. So that was that. That was my, that was my wow. history with Ace Bailey. <laughs> well, I, I... Although I should mention, the dictators, we did do about 10 or 12 shows with them. Oh, really? They had, um, oh, what was the album? It had a cartoon cover. Destroyer? They have an album called Destroyer? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, that was the album they were touring. And we opened about about a dozen shows for them. Really? Yeah. Wouldn't that have... All in cities I had never heard of. I never knew were on the map. Oh, really? Well, so what what was the impetus for that? I mean, just having the same booking agent? I mean, those seem like... Yeah. They're really both rock and roll, but they're coming from different places. Well, but the dictator started with no clubs. Yeah. There was no club scene in America. Right. There was nobody using the term punk rock. There uh-huh. was no, there was nothing in the world in rock and roll like Handsome Dick Manitoba. <laughs> and there was no band that had the kind of songs that Andy Sherlock was writing. Right. And it, the band had, 
led, I would say, equally equal parts music and the band's own particular brand of humor. And uh -huh. humor is not something that has traditionally gone over very well in the right. rock. Humor, I would say, is, is something that, in, in, and not just in music, but I would say even in movies, like, humor is something that works best on a smaller, intimate level. And right. I think of that movie... Um, remember that movie, 1941, where it was like oh, a gigantic yeah. epic comedy? Right. Uh -huh, but Everything about it was epic, except it wasn't funny. You know, it was just <laughs> spread too thin over too big a budget and too bombast. Where people yeah. like the Coen Brothers or something like Christopher Guest, they make these little movies that are hilarious, you know? And that's, right. the dictators kind of had that, that thing. Like, and what worked in a club was not working for the KISS audience, say, you know? I mean, sure. and they were very young. The KISS audience, they were children. They were all, most of the people at KISS shows were there with their parents. Right. And, um, but that's all, but those types of places, you know, we did lots of shows opening for the Blue Oyster Cult because they were our, our brother band. We had the same management and production team. Uh -huh. And, um, I, but you know, honestly, I think you could name more bands that we opened for than didn't open for. You'd have uh -huh. a hard time naming ten bands we didn't open for. <laughs> I mean, that included ACDC. We did shows at ACDC, Thin Lizzy, Cheap Trick, Kiss, um, Bob Seger, Rush, Mahogany Rush, <laughs> um, <laughs> Skit, Mario Speedwagon. I mean, it, it, it's a complete litany of all the '70s bands. Like Which I said, was, that's really all there was. There were no, there was no CBGBs. There was the Whiskey A Go Go and probably the Starwood in, in L.A. Uh -huh. New York had Maxes, and pretty much aside from that, there was just not enough club. You couldn't do what what we really should have been doing. Or right. Well, well so, that was it. You know, it was, it was it was do that or don't work. Well, so of those bands that you were t just talking about, the the you know kind of arena rock or whatever you want to call it, yeah. I mean, real real you know rock bands. Who were the ones that you could learn the most from? Who did you see someone and say, "Boy, we need to step this up"? Or, uh, I mean, who did you learn about? Um, you know, I didn't I didn't so much learn. <sighs> Uh, stuff like that we could use because uh -huh. the stuff that we're talking about could not have been more different in intent, in, in, in their style, and what they thought a rock band should sing about. I mean, we were so different. But what I did learn was that bands that we would privately make fun of, you know, we just, well, we used to pretty much make fun of everything in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody was really safe from us. But right. One of the things that we learned is that these bands were a lot more similar to us than we ever could have imagined. Okay. I remember we went, we had to fly to Davenport, Iowa to open for Audio Speedwagon. And this was before uh -huh. their 80s superstar hit after hit in sure. Nation. And I just thought of them as going into the show, I thought of them you know, a bunch of lame guys with lame sensibilities playing lame music for a lame audience, right? And when I met them, it turned out that their attitude was exactly the same as ours. You know, they really <laughs> believed in what they were doing. They worked their asses off. They were well rehearsed. They had nothing but respect and love for their audience. And that was reciprocated back to them by the audience. Right. And that was a really big lesson, and it stuck with me. And I never automatically dismissed a band ever, ever again because of stuff like that. Wow. Because I thought that maybe they would just be, you know, we were, we were hip, wise guy New Yorkers, you know? I mean, that, that, that problem right there when you walk out, when you cross the state line, you know, when you're no longer sure. in New York. But it was a good lesson to learn. It was a really good life lesson to learn that people that seemed like they could not have been more opposite than you you had a lot more in common with them than you ever could have imagined. Right. Well, and and I guess maybe a different attack on the same question. Who were the ones 
that when you saw them musically, they just really changed your opinion? I mean, who who really blew you off the stage when you were watching? Well, ACDC, for sure. You know, <laughs> we, we were on them on some of their very, very first American shows. And uh-huh. um, they actually opened for us once. Oh, wow. New York. And after the show, they went down and played CBGBs. I mean, they walked down to CBGBs. We would play with them. Um, this place that had been the Academy of Music and became the Palladium on 14th Street, we had line there, and they were the opening act. Michael Stanley Band were the middle act, and ACDC were the opening act. When they finished, they walked down to CBGB's and played there that night. Wow. And they were just, at that point in the beginning, they didn't have, in my opinion, a full set worth of great songs. Right. But if you saw the first 15 minutes and the last 15 minutes of their show, you would have no trouble becoming convinced that this is the best band in the world. <laughs> it was it was so exciting. They had the best live guitar sound I ever heard. Very uh-huh. unprocessed. You know, Angus Young, I don't even know if he had a lead pedal. I think he might have just worked it off the guitar. Uh-huh. It was just that beautiful big tube being overheated, light. It, it, it was, they were great. You know, Cheap Trick were a little, um, they were kind of like, they relied on, I don't want to say, I mean, it was sort of a sense of humor, right? Because they had the two funny guys, basically, and the yeah. two heartthrob guys. Right. But having the two heartthrob guys was a big leg up. Like, if we had <laughs> had maybe one heartthrob guy, <laughs> we might have done a little bit better than we did. We, you know, we didn't do well in those situations. First of all, we weren't good. We didn't get, we did everything backwards, the dictators. We got signed to a major label, to Epic Records. At that point, I had never once played my guitar in front of people I didn't know by their first name. Not <laughs> once. Really? And the what? first time I ever did was in front of 5,000 people opening up for the Blue Oyster Cult and the Stooges at Prince George's Community College in Maryland. Wow. And we had already had it. We were already signed. We did everything completely backwards. What, what did we have? We had great songs that were totally unique in their perspective and sensibilities. We had a great lead guitarist and a real character for our lead singer. But right. Me and Andy, sure enough, we were really beginners, very much so, very much beginners at our instruments. But the one man on earth certainly the one person in the record business who could have come and seen and heard our band and wanted to get us signed was Sandy Perlman and, by extension, his partner, Murray Krugman. The two of them managed and produced the Blue Oyster Cult. And Sandy Perlman had been one of the very first rock writers before they started becoming, becoming called rock critics or rock journalists. In the very beginning, when there was just Crawdaddy Magazine, as the one magazine that stood apart from the teen-oriented uh, music magazines, he was a writing for them. It was a, the first magazine that reviewed and spoke about rock and roll in a serious way, that offered uh, rock criticism as an act of imagination on par with the bands that they were talking about. Uh-huh. And so he was already a hero to me. I knew that I knew his name. And uh, when I saw his name on the Blue Oyster Cult records, I knew who he was. I had never met him, but I sure knew who he was. And I saw that his friend, Richard Meltzer, who was already a hero to me, as he was another one of the original rock writers and became right. the dictator's godfather, we, they had, they, we knew that they were seeing things a little bit more, more askew than the run-of-the-mill or the right-down-the-mill, I should say, hard rock bands of the day. The Blue Oyster Cult had a much more intellectual approach. You know, their lyrics were far different than any other hard rock band or, or any other band, really, at that really, point. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so we had, we, we had that kind of a leg up. But Sandy Perlman now has some juice at, at CBS because the Blue Oyster Cult started to do pretty well right out of the box. And by the third album, they were really starting to do well. Right. And he got us, him and Murray Krugman got us um, 
studio time to record demos for Epic, which gave Epic Records what they called first night of refusal. Sure. Which is a funny way to put it. It's like, we're the first ones that get to say no. We don't want it. You know, <laughs> that's pretty much what they bought. But lo and behold, they said yes. So I was 19 years old, about to record my first record. I'd never played a gig in my life. I'd never played in front of anyone I didn't know. And here I am in CBS Studios. He's like the famous hallowed halls. So we did our demos at the CBS Church, where a lot of really high-end, famous jazz records were made. I think a few of Miles Davis's big records were done there. Right. We did the yeah. album itself at the CBS Studios on 52nd Street, and or 50th Street. I can't remember that was now. And we're off and running, you know. So we had to get out there and play. But like I was saying, there was nowhere to do it. There was that one little club, the Coventry in Queens. But outside of that, if you wanted to get outside in New York, you had to find a band that you could open for. Right. The punk scene, as it became known, didn't really start to occur until like 76. And by then, we were two years into having, into uh, being a recording, because being recording artists. Two years into doing these arena shows, I would say that 70% of the shows we did were in front of 15, 10 to 15,000 people or more. Wow. And we never did well. That was the thing. What we were doing wasn't translating. And it, it, it got to be, we had fun with ourselves, you know, because we were very close. Uh, Manitoba and I had already been best buddies since we were 10 years old. And... We had our own fun, but I remember those rides between shows, like eight hours in a car, eight hours in a van, feeling that feeling of, here we go, you know, we're going to drive eight hours, we're going to feel totally burnt out by the time we get wherever we're going, uh-huh. and then we're going to go out there tonight, and we're going to do our best, and no one's going to give a shit. That was the story <laughs> of our lives. And that went on and on until in November of 77, We finally got to go to Europe, and this was the height of the punk thing. When we got over there, the Pistols had the number one album in the country, even though you couldn't write the word bollocks in print. So wherever you saw the name, never mind the bollocks, the word bollocks was just crossed out, so it was never mind the blank. Here come the the Sex Pistols or something like that. And we got invited by the Stranglers, who at that point had two albums in the top five. And all the all of our sort of um our counterparts in, in the British scene, like the guys from the class or the guys from the jam or Sid Vicious or Billy Idol and Tony James, they were all guys like us. They were huge rock and roll fans. Sure. And they knew everything about us the way I knew all I already knew all about their band. Oh, and wow. So we ended up hitting it off with people like that. I was friendly with Billy Idol for a few years after that trip. I was friendly with Hugh Cornwell from the Stranglers, who was the guy who actually invited us to come over. We opened about 15 shows of their tour, as well as doing shows on our own. And I met Vic and Joe from The Clash. And uh, I was friends with Bruce, Bruce Foxton, who was the bass player in the jam. And it was, it felt great, you know, because all of a sudden after feeling like outcasts and we were never felt exactly like we belonged at CBGB's the way television and the Ramones and Blondie all really seemed to be, have been born there in a way. <laughs> we, by the time CBGB's opened, we had already been playing for a year and right. our thing was had bordered on, on, on hard rock itself. You know, we weren't exactly, but we were nothing really like any of the established hard rock bands. Right. But musically, it wasn't that much of a stretch. You know, Ross and Boss, who was our one sort of claim to being a professional band, really could take on any of those players and any of those other bands and hold his own pretty well. Right. And because of that, the CBGB crowd, I don't think they knew in the beginning, especially, they really didn't know what to make of us. You know, we well, seemed like, well, we kind of aren't really like, we're not really like sticks or anything. We're not really like Mario Speedwagon, but 
then again, we're not really like television or the Ramones either. Right. So we, we like over the next year or two, we kind of got got adopted by that scene. Hilly, who owned CBGB, who was great to the Delawares. I, I mean, to the dictator. But and, and as I was almost said there by accident, but truthfully, as he also was to the Delawares, he was fantastic to us. He treated us great. He really was another person who early on was instrumental in um, in helping the band get along. Sure. So everything was a funny fit for us all along. And to, and to this day, you'll see history books on the subject of the New York punk scene. And some of the, it's about 50-50 whether they include us or not. Right. And, I mean, they, they can argue back and forth whether we're a real CBGB's band. I mean, the idea of that alone is like, what are you talking about? Yeah, you know, that's a, a silly real, thing. A real CBGB's <laughs> But um some would argue we weren't, and some would argue we were. And one way or another, the one thing that's inarguable is that we were there. And I, right. I would say I probably played that stage close to as many times as anybody else played that stage, except maybe Lenny Kay. Uh-huh. But I bet I'm close to 100 times on that stage over the years that we played there, between the Delors, my solo career, between playing with Helen Wheels and, and playing with the Dictators. Right. So it all got it, it all got mushed together. But over in England, they didn't have any of that any of that stuff. They just saw our names. They saw that there was some kind of association with CBGBs, and that was all they needed to know. Uh-huh. And so they all those those guys and all of those bands came out to see us. The way everyone in the bands in the New York came out to see the Clash when they hit New York, or they came out to see the jam when they played. They jam played CBGBs once even themselves. Uh-huh. And um, so that was kind of the story, you know? And in the Dictators in the 70s, we made three albums, and it ended up being too little, too late. You know, the third album came out. We had finally become a fairly good rock band live. And ACDC... We became friends with ACDC, and they really wanted us to come to Australia to open up their Australian tour. But Electra Asylum, who was our label, decided they had a better idea. They decided they should drop the band from the label instead, <laughs> which is what happened. So oh. everything, by the time we got, we got good too late. You know, we didn't, we didn't spend two years in, in the clubs just, just honing our craft and trying to get better. We got taken from our rehearsal space Play, having played no gigs into the CBS studio to record an album. The CBS. Yeah. And well, and do, do you think that, um, in a way, that maybe those large arena shows are more forgiving in a way than the club shows? I mean, is, is, well, is there a different they, way to approach they it? They could be, except they also allow the audience the anonymity to ignore you. <laughs> in a way that a club show would never. And uh-huh. that was mostly the reaction. You know, we didn't get booed. It was just kind of this benign indifference. The real test in those days was, well, in the local record stores, the day after you played, did people go out looking for the record? Right. And in our case, the answer was no. Um, Although, okay. it's funny how many people I meet these days who tell me that they did see the band in the, in the arena days, and they did go out and buy the records. Uh-huh. And in a way, the dictators were a little like, I mean, I would never compare ourselves to the Velvet Underground because they're my very favorite American band of all time. And I idolize them and I love Lou Reed. He's a great guy and, uh, yeah. and um, a hero and, and an inspiration. But the way Brian Eno had once said, you know, the Velvet Underground sold maybe 30,000 records in the beginning, but every one of the, every one of the bought one started a band. Right. And the dictators right. seem to have a little bit of that to them themselves. You know, when we first met Joey Ramone, first of all, he wasn't Joey Ramone yet. He was, and he was a drummer in a glam band. Uh-huh. And so that we were, we were ahead of the curve. That was the other thing that made it difficult for us to feel like family with, with the other CBGB fans. Uh-huh. Well, so what is, we was, just, Joey a, yeah. was Joey a dictators fan? Is that how you guys... Oh yeah, yeah. He he was a fan, and and in the end, Andy Sharp and him 
But when, when Joey passed away, Andy was in the room. You know, Andy and he became oh, wow. very, very close friends. And, uh-huh. you know, we were friends with every band. You know, we were friendly guys. We were from the Bronx. We didn't have any real attitude. We didn't come to Manhattan with, like, visions of Andy Warhol dancing in our heads, you know. We were <laughs> we were like a, a bunch of middle-class kids from the Bronx, wise-ass kids who loved rock and roll. And right. that, was, that, that was pretty much it. That was what we did. That was who we were. And we had no problem making friends with other bands. There was no sense of competition with any of the other bands. Um, the Ramones were friends. The Dead Boys were friends. The Cramps were friends. And, uh, you know, and, still, and Blondie were friends. I mean, I'm still friends with Clem Burke. I still see Clem. Uh-huh. Every once in a while. Usually it shows I run into him. Uh-huh. And um, that's really how it's remained. You know, we ended up, over the years, they, they, we became, I would think that the other bands probably thought of us as, you know, quote, unquote, real CBGB band. Right. Even if the, even if the press and the critics and the, the writers <laughs> did not. Well, um, so at some point, um, I, I've heard Eric's stories about how, you know, he first met uh, Lou Reed. Is that also how you became introduced <laughs> to him? Yes. Okay. Met Lou Reed. It was uh, we had this again. We had the same booking agent. <laughs> Excuse me. It's okay. I'm getting a little cold here. Um, um, we had the same booking agent, and Lou Reed was going out on the road, and he needed an opening act. So the booking agency gave him a stack of like twenty records to listen to, and according to Lou, he hated them all except for <laughs> one, and that was that. That was the Dead Wars record. Right. And he recognized the kinship. He recognized that there was something familiar about what the Dell Lords do and what he was always about. Right. So he picked us to be the opening act. And, you know, I, just like everybody else, had heard all the stories about how mean and, and ornery and tough to get along with and all that stuff about Lou. And the person I met, was just one of the nicest, most gracious, gentlemanly, generous people I've ever met in my life anywhere, music or outside of music. Uh And certainly not the Lou Reed of of Infamy. And anybody who's ever been an opening act for a a much bigger band the way we were when we were opening for Lou knows that sound checks are usually not going to happen. There's usually no time for the opening act to have a sound check. But instead, Lou Reed stood on that stage for the first few nights to make to, so that his road crew knew that every night the Del Wars get a sound check. Oh, wow. No questions asked. That wow. we were there as at his invitation, and he was the host, and he took responsibility for our comfort, for our well-being, for... Just, I invited these people. They're not. I, I didn't invite them here to get treated by shit, like shit, or be ignored right. by by my own road crew. And it, wow. you know, and one thing about the Del Hoys, we always got along great with everybody's road crew. You know, we related to the guys on the crew. We related to guys that worked like that and worked really hard. And um, and it was a great, great time. And during the tour. Manny's father, Manny Coyote, was the original bass player. Right. And Manny's dad passed away on a Thursday or a Wednesday. And we woke up on a Thursday morning. We were out on the road, and we found out Manny had already flown home. And when we figured that, you know, well, I guess that's the end of the tour. And Lou, we obviously had the weekend shows coming up. He had to replace us. You know, he needed somebody to open the shows. But not only did he refuse to replace us, but he extended his own set that, those nights, like by another 20 minutes, and he sent over a thousand dollars worth of flowers to Manny's father's funeral. Oh wow! And that right there is an illustration to me of, of exactly the kind of guy Lou Reed really is. Wow! I never once saw that other Lou Reed, and he was my neighbor. He was my yeah. neighbor, and, and when I was still living in New York in the village, Lou Reed lived around the corner. And every once in a while, I'd run into him, you know? Uh-huh. And it was just so wild. I don't know, running into Lou Reed. 
the first time I ran into Lou, I was walking behind him, and I'm looking ahead, and I'm that's, that's Lou, right? Uh, yeah. But hey, Lou, 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 and he's not turning around. Lou, Scott, the Dell was, and he turns around, like, oh, oh, Scott, I'm really sorry, man. I, I, I just never answer people in the street. I go, uh, what's up with that, Lou? And he said, <laughs> you have no idea how many times somebody's come up to introduce themselves to me in the street, and what they want to tell me is how they OD'd listening to heroin. How they shot up for the first time listening to heroin. He goes, oh, wow. it gets really old really fast. And I was like, <laughs> wow, I never, I, I never would have thought about that. But right. I can imagine how, you know, that at first of all, it's missing the point about the song, right? And then second right. of all, Absolutely. it's an ugly, awful thing to feel like you're in any way responsible for, even if it's not directly your cause, even to be in the chain of events that leads to somebody hurting themselves or throwing their lives away on heroin, I mean, that's that's a heavy burden to carry, you know, for your arm yeah. especially. And But every once in a while I run into him, we go grab a cup of coffee, we grab a burger, and ironically, one of the things we talked about almost all the time was he loved doo-wop. He was oh, a yeah. huge doo-wop fanatic. Right. And he especially right. loved Dion. Right. So at that point, was maybe five or six years away from me meeting him and becoming this one of my the best friends of my entire life. Wow, and I've been right. friends now with Dion for twenty years and he really is like the big brother I never had. So there was that connection as well. And as a matter of fact, the last time I ever saw Lou I was staying with a buddy of mine who is actually the guy who owns the record company that put out the last, uh, the most recent Del Lord's record, Elvis Club. Uh-huh. He was on the reissue of the record that I made with the Skeletons. And right. um, also, was supposed to be a non-coffee drinker. Right? So uh-huh. at 8 o'clock on a winter Sunday morning, I was in New York to be taking, what was I doing? Oh, you know, I was asked to take part in this symposium in Jersey called the Glory Days Symposium. It was an uh-huh. entire week of lectures and events centered around Bruce Springsteen, right? <laughs> who was also a friend, who I also met way back in 1975. Right. Uh-huh. So I, I was happy to be doing that. So I'm walking two blocks in a freezing cold Sunday morning to get coffee. Because, I mean, I can't even open my eyes without coffee. And here I am walking two blocks in the snow. And when I get to Hudson Street, I turn the corner and there's Lou Reed. And uh-huh. Lori Anderson, and they're walking a little dog. And I go, Lou, and he looks, I go, Scott from the Dolores, and he gets so excited to see me. <laughs> like, I, I can't believe it, you know? That's why I didn't know if he'd remember me. He was so happy to see me. So I was raving about the band to Lori Anderson, telling you how good the band was, and how we were. So we honored him by agreeing to sing with him on, on the song Rock and Roll. <laughs> we honored him. You know, it just blew my mind. And I realized this isn't the Lou Reed who's up on bright and early on a Sunday morning because he's been speeding since Thursday. Right. You know, this is the new Lou Reed who is clean and sober and was up early in the morning because he had to walk the dog. You know, right. Like everybody else. And, <laughs> Just stood there and talked with him for a while. I told him, that, you know, after the last time I saw him, how I had heard from Dion, and we ended up having a band together, and I wrote all these songs with Dion, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he had inducted Dion into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and they were great friends. They were really, they really, the two guys who could not have been more opposite. They really uh-huh. loved each other. And, you know, that was a good thing, too. So wow. that was the very last time I, I you know, I saw Lou. Thanks for listening to part one of my interview with Scott Kempner. Tomorrow, join us to hear about his friendship with Bruce Springsteen, his solo records, and other points of collaborating with uh, the Dell Lords. Visit dalewileyshow.net, throw some money, buy some books. Copyright 2016.